chains are falling, falling to the ground. Well, I hear those chains are falling, oh, they're falling to the ground. Well, I hear those chains are falling, falling fall to the ground. And I hear my Savior Test, test, one, two, three. All right, how y'all doing today? My name is Marco, and I have a couple of announcements. I want to start off by saying welcome to Riverside Church. We believe everybody has purpose, and anyone's expected, anyone can serve and is expected to grow. Uh, for announcements, I do want to announce that next week will be our Riverside Quarterly. We'll be meeting here uh, at 11 a.m. There will not be a 9 a.m. service, and that's when we'll do our Christmas thing here. We'll have a performance or a little show and games. So come out and have fun with us. That'll be next week at 11 a.m. Also, hangouts. They'll start back up again January. So right now they're on, they are on pause. But once we get them back up in January, we'll start announcing those. And those can always be found on our app. And I'm going to go ahead and pray over our tithes and offerings. But before I do... Uh, Make sure everybody knows there's envelopes behind the chairs. You can give at the kiosk back there, um, or you could give through our cash app. If you need that information, you can let me know. I'll get that to you. Uh, so go ahead, close your eyes, bite your head. Thank you, Father God, for today's tithes and offerings, Father. We pray that they uh, that they are to go to further your ministry, Father. We pray that it, we're sowing in good ground, Father. Thank you for everything that we're praying for, everything that we're believing for, Father, that we place our faith in you, Father, to see those things through. I also want to pray for today's message, Father, that it brings nourishment to our soul, Father, that it, it feeds us, Father, and it gives us the wisdom that we need to be able to, to fulfill your calling. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Riverside Wiggle at tip. Use the check-in button, lets us know that you made it to service, whether in person or online, from the comfort of your couch. It takes about two minutes. Once you open the Riverside app, you click the check-in button to check in. There are two required fields that you need to fill out, your email and your phone number. Once you do it the first time, you should have autofill available for each time after that. Fill in all the fields that apply to you, then hit submit, and this will help us know that you're connecting online and then you can go and comment and message in the message board so that way we know what you're thinking when Pastor Solo says all the really, really difficult things that he says that he expects us to process. I hope this helped and be on the lookout for more tips. Hey, this is a life. morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody doing good? Man, it's good to see everybody. I'm going to scoot over and sit down today. I might walk around. I don't know yet. We'll see what that looks like. So, uh, everybody doing good? Oh, sweet, man. I appreciate everybody coming. Um, we are... Um, we are in a, I don't want to call it a series because it's not really a series, but we've been doing a series of messages and we've been talking about, um, uh, one of the things we talked about is being uh, uh, lorded over or having uh, someone lord over us. And then we talked about um, committing to a yes or no, say yes or no, and be, having, having a strong, uh, having a strong no or a, a strong yes and not having a weak yes. And so, and having a weak no. And so... Um, with that process, I'm, I'm really building um, to where we're going in January for our series that's going on in January that we're going to be doing. We do a series in January every year called um, First. And so um, uh, I'm kind of laying a foundation for, for where we're going there. And so um, if you haven't uh, been able to uh, make all the services during the last three messages, I want to encourage you to go back and watch those on our app. And so uh, you can get caught up and then um, be on the same page for January. Amen. Amen. Okay. So um, when we think about um, faith, being faithful and what faithful uh, faithfulness looks like, um, we never really uh, look at it from a perspective um, in a lot of different areas. A lot of times when we think about being faithful, um, we think about um, God being faithful, right? The scripture talks about how God's faithful. Uh, you go through all the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. It talks about how God, God's faithful in, in all these different uh, all these different areas, right? And so, 
Um, when I used to think about uh, being faithful, what faithful looks like, it's always been in my relationship with God, right? So God's, God's faithful, then I try to be faithful the way that God is faithful, right? And where, we, where, where the breakdown is, or we break down a lot of times, is realizing, or should I say not realizing, that um, God's faithful, we try to be faithful to God, but a lot of times we're not real good faithful with each other. This is where that tension is, if we're not real faithful with each other. And so when we think about the word faithful and what that looks like, what, is, what, is, um, what does it mean to be faithful? What does it look like to be faithful? Um, so asking a question, how do you define faithful? Bueller. Bueller. Trust. Anybody else? Submitted. How do you define faithful? How do we define it? Consistence. Honesty. What was that? Oh, subscription. You got to keep paying. <laughs> subscription. You got to subscribe, right? Um, and so when 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 we when we think about faith when we think about faithfulness we have these different um, identifying factors or terms or words that we use um, to define what faithful looks like and so we we've all struggled with being lorded over because that's what, one of the things that we want we want somebody to tell us what to do when to do it how to do it right um, we we struggle with um, uh, making our yeses yes and our noes noes because sometimes we can find ourselves to be people pleasers, right? We want to, we want to please people. And so um, when we talked about being lorded over and we talked about our yeses being yeses and our noes being noes, um, we have to look at, at the freedom that we want to have as adults. Like we all want to be treated like adults. We all want to be talked to like adults. But a lot of times when it comes to faithfulness, and being faithful and being committed to a yes and being committed to a no and, and somebody lording over us, we just don't like the freedom that we have in that, right? We all know those people, you know, you work with them, go to school with them, right? They come to this church, right? They're in our houses, right? In our homes, in our families, right? And we, we struggle with this and that tension is because um, we, want, we're, we want people to be faithful, but we're very... We struggle with being faithful ourselves, even though God is faithful, right? And so looking at, at being able to walk in that freedom of adulthood, right? Because when, when you have situations, you're working with somebody or somebody in your family or, or wherever you're at, right? Most of the time, of course, it's work. A lot of times, of course, it, it's, uh, it's at work. Um, we want people to be responsible, and uh, we struggle with that. And so like sometimes when they do things or they don't do the things that they're supposed to do, or they do something they're not supposed to do, we, we have this question in our mind. Whether we say it out loud or not, we're just like, what are you for? Like, did you not, did you not say you were going to do this? Are you five, three? Like, you said you weren't going to do this, but yet you're doing this, right? And so we struggle with that. That's that tension. So I want to look at uh, Webster's definition of how we define or how Webster defines faithful. Webster's de definition of faithful is this, as an adjective. So it's an adjective and a noun. It can be used as an adjective or a noun. Adjective is this, steadfast in affection or allegiance, loyal, firm in adherence to promises or in observa observation of duty, being conscientious, giving with strong assurance, binding, true to the facts, to a standard or to an original thing or principle, Right? That's faithfulness. The noun is the actual fact of being faithful. Being faithful, loyal, committed, in action, deed, or principle. Right? So when you think about what faithful looks like from the dictionary's perspective, it's kind of like, you're kind of like, okay, well, consistency, right? It, it, it's something that, that's not going to change. Well, our issue that we have within the church, our issue that we have with, as being believers is that our faithfulness tends, tends to waver and change and, and it goes back, back this way, back that way, right? It, it's, sometimes we're faithful, but we're not faithful. Sometimes we're, we're committed, but we're not committed. And sometimes it's a strong yes, and sometimes it's a weak no, and sometimes it's a weak, a strong no, and sometimes it's a weak yes. 
right? And so we struggle with faithfulness. And the reason we struggle with faithfulness is because we struggle um, with another word that we don't like. It's called commitment. Okay, I'll stop there for just a second. I can see how y'all are staring at me. Some of y'all are looking at me like Superman. Burning a hole right through me. Okay, Matthew chapter, go over to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 23 through 30. It says, the master, the master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant with one bag of silver came and said, master, I knew you were a harsh man and harvesting crops. So you did, uh, you didn't plant and gathering crops where you didn't cultivate. So from this passage is, when you go, when you go down through the rest of these passages, it's literally uh, the conclusion of a parable that Jesus is talking about, about stewardship, right? The five talents. So he's talking about the different five talents. But what I want to focus on and look at in this parable that Jesus talks about, he talked about stewardship. He talks, he says this, he says, the master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount. So now I will give you more responsibilities. See, But we have to understand that being faithful is way deeper than we think it is. He says, I've given you a small responsibility so I can give you more responsibility, bigger responsibility. But what a lot of times what we do is we find ourselves struggling to handle the small things, but we want the big things. And then we get upset when we're not chosen because we don't get the big things. Well, why can't I? Why can't I do this? Well, it's because you weren't. You can you just come to work on time? Why didn't I get promoted? Well, probably weren't very good steward. Okay, not over your time. It may be an over your time, but maybe it was just over your what you were responsible for. Well, I was on time all the time. You don't get credit for being on time. You don't get credit for doing what you're supposed to do. Right. That's called being responsible. That's called being committed. That's called being faithful to what you've been called to do. So he talks about all this on the, on, uh, on this, in this parable. And on the, on the back end of this parable, if you're not a good, if you're not faithful, because he talked about being faithful, he says, if you, because you were faithful with the small things, if you don't find yourself faithful, what God says, what Jesus says, what the parable's saying here is that if you're not faithful with the small things, then you don't get any responsibility. Take that responsibility and I'll give it to somebody else. This is the part that we struggle with. You get upset. Well, you asked me to do this, or you asked, I was told to do this, or I was getting paid to do this. This is why people get fired. Right? And the reason it is is because we, we want to do things for the kingdom of God. We want to do things at our job. We want to do things for our family, but we can't even do this one thing. I love parents. Parents are the best and the worst at the same time. Mommy, mommy, I want a dog. And I love Marco's example last week. I want a dog. You can't handle the responsibility. The only reason most of our kids are still living is because they come and actually tell us that they're hungry. <laughs> Otherwise, well, I didn't know he was hungry. He didn't say he was hungry. Well, you got to feed him, right? Because a dog doesn't be like, yo, I'm hungry, right? And if you forget to feed the dog, dog will die. Right? You don't take care of the dog. Dog and I, we like, we, and we tell our kids, you don't have the, that's a lot of responsibility. Right? And that's, that's literally what, what Jesus is saying in this parable is like, you want some things, you want to be responsible for some things, but I need you to be responsible for the very small things because I want to give you greater responsibility, but I need you to be responsible for the smaller things. Or I need you to be faithful what I've, what I've, with what I'm giving you now, regardless of how small it is. Go over to Luke chapter 16. Are y'all okay? Y'all are quiet this morning. You're making me nervous. Luke chapter 16, verse 9. It says, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then your possessions are, when your possessions are gone, they will, come, they, will, they will welcome you in eternal home. It says, if you are faithful with the little things, you will be faithful with large ones. But if you are dishonest with little things, you won't be honest with greater things or greater responsibilities. I think it's interesting that he uses this phrase, dishonest. 
He says, let me read this again. He says, if you're faithful with the little things, you'll be faithful with the large ones. But if you are dishonest with little things, you won't be honest with greater things. So he equates lack of faithfulness with what? Dishonesty. And we don't do that. We say, oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, we just kind of, yeah, sorry. I was said I was going to, but I didn't. That's, that's, that's Pastor Me and I's favorite saying. She used to say that all the time when she was growing up. She told me, I thought I was going to, but I didn't. You going to clean your room? I thought I was going to, but I didn't. Did you brush your teeth? Well, I thought I was going to, but I didn't. So our, our, one of the running jokes in, in our marriage is that if we didn't do something that we said we were going to do, we, we, that's our response. Well, I thought I was going to, but I didn't, right? And this is how we respond to God. This is how we respond to each other in our relationships. When we don't do it, well, I thought I was going to, but I didn't. Or I said I was going to, but I didn't. And he, he equates it here. It says, if you are faithful with the little things, you will be in charge with large ones. But if you are dishonest, think about us being dishonest. Let me rephrase that. Think about us not being faithful. That's dishonesty in the sight of God. I didn't say that. That's what it says right there. Like those are the comparisons. He didn't say, he didn't say, this is what it doesn't say. He doesn't say, if you're faithful with the little things, then you will be faithful, you will be faithful with large ones. But if you're not faithful with little things, you won't be faithful with great ones. He literally says, if the word literally says dishonest. That's kind of that kind, right at you, isn't it? Like, well, God, well, I suck. Right? And it's not that we suck as much as that we can get better. In other words, if someone asks you to do something and you know you can't do it, then say no. Now you're not being dishonest. You're being what? Honest. Let your yeses be yeses and your noes be noes. The hardest thing is for the hardest thing for me as a as a pastor and as leader is when my team says, mm, "Yeah, no." It's even harder when you send a text message out to the team on a feed and nobody responds. Get left on red. I'm just being real. Like they know that because and because but they have the freedom. Listen, they have the freedom and we have an understanding in our relationship that they don't have to respond immediately. They can wait. I realize that they have jobs, families. I, I realize that they have their things going on that I may not necessarily be the priority at that time. But we've learned to have that. We've learned to establish that in our relationship in the way we lead. I don't expect you to say yes every time I ask for something or every time I text. I, do I expect a response? Yes. Do I expect it to be right then? No. Does that make sense? And do you realize how honest you can have in a relationship when you're like, mm, no. Right? But what we do is we put a facade on and we go, uh, yeah, I'll do that. And we all in our head and our hearts know that we don't want to do it. But we say yes because we become people pleasers. And the reason we become people pleasers is because we've been lorded over so long that we don't know how to say or utilize a no. Or we don't know how to utilize a strong yes. And this is where we struggle. And we do that because we don't realize that being not being faithful with the small things is actually dishonesty. Look over at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, says this. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces these kinds of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against. It says, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed their passions and desires to the sinful nature, to the cross, and crucified them there. Let me read those fruits of the Spirit again. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. So, Pastor, you're missing faithfulness. Ha ha. If you know the fruits, then you're like, you're missing faithfulness. It says, peace, joy, I'm sorry, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, if we're born again, then we should be faithful. That means that we should always be honest. But we live in a world of called timidity. Well, we're timid to say no. Well, I can't tell them no. It's the church. It's the pastor. I'm part of the team. 
Sometimes you have to know when to bow out. Sometimes you have to know when to take a knee. Sometimes you have to know, like, look, I need a break. And if you can't say that you need a break, then you probably need to work on your relationship. You should be able to say, look, I need a break. And the team and the leader, this particular position is me, should be able to go, okay, take a break. It's okay. I'm not mad at you. Right? But we don't do that. We're just like, we drug and trudge through the yes. Uh, right? Because we haven't got to a place where we're able to say no. Like, I need a break. Time out. Right? Yes, no. And then what happens is, is we say yes half-heartedly, and then it becomes work, and we no longer enjoy what we're doing or what we want to do is because our yes is not strong. It's weak. And now we're doing something that we want to do, but we don't have time to do, and so we're trying to get it done, and now we're not even enjoying what we said that we wanted to do to start out with. Right? And this is not how the kingdom of God works. He wants us to be able to say no. He wants us to be able to say yes. Jesus himself does not come over and say, I am now Lord of your life. You have to make Jesus Lord of your life. That's our, He gives us that freedom. He gives us that choice. Go over to Acts chapter uh, 6. I know I'm sharing a lot of scriptures today. So I'm like, man, he's got a lot of scriptures today. Acts chapter 6, uh, verse 1 through 7. I'm probably not going to go through this whole thing, but you can write those down. Acts chapter 6, it says, But as believers rapidly multiplied, they were rumbling and discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against, be, being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers, and they said, We apostles should spend our time teaching the word, not running a food program. And so the brothers selected seven men whom were well-respected and full of spirit and wisdom. We'll, uh, we will give them this responsibility. Then the apostles can spend time more, or spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Now, it says here, it says, um, I lost my place. Uh, it says, the twelve called a meeting of the believers, and they said, we apostles should spend time uh, not running the food program. It says, and so the brothers selected men who were re well-respected and were full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will give them this responsibility. It says, we will give them this responsibility. We will give them this responsibility. In God's Word translation, it says this. It says, we will give them this problem to handle. <laughs> what we do, we live in a world, in a church culture, where we want the pastor and the leaders to take care of all the situations and problems. Now, if you've been involved at Riverside Community Church at any time, for any length of time, and been involved in any contact with any of the leadership here at Riverside Community Church, I don't really solve problems. We identify problems. Well, we've got a situation. Can y'all fix that? And if you don't like solving problems, you're like, I don't like, I don't like coming to church here. But what I'm doing is really scriptural. Identify problems. Who identified the problem in the scripture? The apostles. They're like, we got a problem. These people are fighting and arguing about food. Sounds just like kids. That's my, that's my chicken wing, right? Like, that's my Chick-fil-A. He got my fry, right? So I identified the problem. They said, okay, we need somebody to solve, to oversee these problems, oversee these responsibilities. And what we do a lot of times in the church, we want the pastors and the leaders to identify, solve, fix the problems so that we can come to church and do what we want to do and not have any responsibility. That's not scriptural. Let me read that again. It says... We will give them, them this responsibility so we apostles can spend the time in prayer teaching the Word. Now, last week I talked about how the, how the disciples got together and they were addressing a problem, Paul and Peter, and they got together because they were trying to address a problem on circumcision, right? And it says in the Scriptures over in Acts, it says, it says and it seemed good to them, right? It wasn't a, thus saith the Lord, it wasn't a prophecy. It wasn't a tongue and interpretation. It, it, it wasn't a, a word of knowledge. It, they, had some in, they had some information. They gathered some facts, and they say, it seems good to me that we do this. Are y'all remember I'm talking about that? Let's you can go back and read it. Okay. It's over in Acts. Where at? Go find it. Okay. Or go watch last week, and I'll, I'll give you the exact scripture. 
In verse 5, right here, we're reading. In verse 5, it says this. It says, let me read the whole thing so in context. It says, and so, brothers and, sis, so, and so the brothers selected seven men who were well-respected and full of spirit and wisdom. It says, and uh, we will give this, them this responsibility. Then we, the apostles, can spend, time, spend our time in prayer and teaching the Word. Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following individuals. So they chose their seven folks that they're going to do these. Stephen and these other guys, right? Philip and all these other guys, because I can't pronounce their names, so these are other guys. It says they chose, they chose these to be the servants over the tables. It says these seven men were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as, as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of the believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were, then, or were also converted or were converted to. Now, there are two things that are happening here. One, the, the, the apostles, the leaders of the church, just identified the problem. And when you read this closely in context, they're not the ones that went and found somebody. It says, hey, can you guys find us somebody to solve this problem? So it wasn't even the, it wasn't even the, the, the apostles. It wasn't like the church leaders. So when we have situations at Riverside, this is what happens. We've got this situation, or we have this project that we want to get done, or we have this, this event that we're wanting to do. And so we say, hey, um, my question to them is, hey, we're doing this. I said, who can we get to do this? Who can we get to help? And you know what we do? We create a list, big old long list. And guess what you have to be on to get on that list? Faithful. You got to be faithful to get on that list. Well, how come I'm never on the list? Aha. I'm letting you know. Ning, 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 ning. Take a note, right? But if you're on that list, you show yourself to be faithful. You showed yourself to be approved. Like you're, you've let your yeses be yeses, your noes be noes. You're on the list. Now, what is interesting is that a lot of times we'll come and we'll say, hey, can you help us with this? And they'll be yes, but they really mean no. Right? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. And you're like, no, I don't want to do that. Don't ask me to do this. Don't ask me to do this. And that's why I don't ask anybody to do anything, because they don't know how to tell Pastor Cello no. They just go, sure, yeah, I'll do it. Occasionally I ask somebody to do something, but I really try not to do that. Now, when you look at this, it says it seemed good to them and the Holy Ghost. And in verse 5 here, it says, seemed like a good idea. So the scary part about running a church, the scary part, scary part of being involved in the church, being the culture, being, being a part of the body of Christ, is that we literally get to do ministry the way we want to. That's the scary part about it. Well, I'm waiting for the Lord to show me. Probably not going to show you. He might unct you. He may show you something, but he's not going to show you the whole picture. It'll be just like a little piece. And did you get a piece of the puzzle? Yeah. Did you get a piece of the puzzle? Yes. You get a piece of the puzzle? Well, let's put it together like this. It seems good. Right? And then as you begin to walk that, you begin to become more faithful, and now you're, you're actually living by faith. Now you're being faithful with the small things, right? So when you think about, when you think about, where we're at, where, where we are as a church, where you are in your job, where you are in your relationships. I have a question I want to ask you this morning. I have several questions, but you know me, I always ask questions. When you think about faithfulness, the one word that we don't like, um, we, we shy away from it, so much so that we, we use it all the time, or we, we use the action of it, very limited. And the word that goes with faithfulness that we don't like is commitment. You can't be committed and be faithful. Let me rephrase that. You cannot be committed and be faithful. In other words, you can't be faithful without being committed, and you can't be committed without being faithful. What we want to do is we want to be faithful without the commitment, but you can't have one without the other. So my question to you this morning is this. What is it that you are currently committed to? And whatever you're committed to in your job, in your relationships, in the church, wherever it is, in your finances, in all these different areas, whatever it is that you're committed to, I guarantee you that's where you're faithful. Some of us are so committed to our jobs because we're more concerned about the check than we are what we're doing. 
We're committed. We're committed to the company. Well, as long as you take that check away, I bet you're not committed no more. Go find somewhere else to commit. Right? And that's, that's what's tough is because the church, guess what? You don't get paid. If anything, it costs you. Cost your feelings, cost your time, cost your finances, cost you work, sweat, tears. But wait a minute. And you want me to give? Oh my God, who signed up for this? <laughs> right? And so our commitment level literally, or our faithfulness is literally a direct proportion to how committed we are. So what is it that you're committed to? Whatever you're committed to, I guarantee you, you're probably faithful to. What you, the, the, the understanding that we cannot separate these two. So looking at our yeses, if we're not committed in our yes, then we're not going to be faithful with what we said we would do with the responsibility that we've taken or said that we would take. If we're, if we're not committed um, in a no, then we'll change our meaning. We'll be easily swayed back and forth. Other outside situations will, will sway us in our commitment. They'll sway us in, in our yes or our no. Right? Let me share this. Faithfulness, you can write this down. This, this is tweetable right here. Snapchat worthy. You ready? Here we go. Faithfulness will not find a reason or an excuse not to be faithful or committed. Faithfulness will not find a reason or an excuse not to be faithful or committed. Actually, faithfulness produces all the reasons why we are faithful and committed. When you're faithful, you always have the reasons why you're faithful. When you're faithful, you always have the reasons why you're committed. And this is, will not, this is why outside, outside reasons and sources will not sway you. You say, no, I've committed to this. I'm sorry, I've committed to this. I am being faithful to this area. I'm being faithful to this job. I'm being faithful to this team. I'm being faithful to my, my relationships, right? Marriage, whatever, friendships, it doesn't matter. When you, when you say that this is where it's, but it's walking that out that makes it tough because you have to, you have to not allow all these other things to sway you from what you've committed and what you're being faithful to. So if you really want to see what faith looks like, in action, find somebody that's faithful because that's what faith looks like. Because faith is the evidence of things not seen, right? So they're doing things even though they're not seeing anything. That's being faithful, is being able to be committed even when you have no reason to. Think about that for a second. We all come to church because, well, we won't go to hell. We don't want to burn. We're going to church. So I'm going to be faithful. Well, if you're trying to be faithful for, if you're trying to be faithful for uh, trying to get to heaven and, and, and you, you want to go see Jesus, um, you probably want to check your, your, your level of commitment because you're probably committed for the wrong reason. If anything, we should do things for the church and in the church because we are saved, because, well, because of our relationship, right? This is where we're at. So when you look at that, so as the pastor... Um, I'm going to make some clarification statements here. <clears throat> Hope y'all don't throw anything at me. Keep the cell phones because you're not getting it back. I'll upgrade if you throw a cell phone at me. As the pastor, as the leader of the church at Riverside Community Church, I am responsible to give you direction. I'm responsible as a pastor to give direction. That's my responsibility. I, I have to give you vision. I have to give the vision of what we're doing, what we're going that's my responsibility. The mission, my responsibility. Our why, my responsibility. Correction, my responsibility. I'm responsible to do those things. If I'm not doing those things, I will have to answer for those things to God. Are y'all following me? I'm responsible for being a good steward over everything that we have. Let me tell you what I'm not responsible for. I'm not responsible for how we do those things. I'm not responsible for how we do those things. I'm not responsible for when. Switching to new mic.
So I'm not, re- I'm not responsible for how you do things, when you do things, or what it is that you actually do as a follower of Christ, as being a part of Riverside Community Church. That's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to give you direction, give you correction, give you, give you um, vision, mission. Like That's my responsibility, to be a good steward over the things that we have, over the individuals, over the people, over the process, over, over the, the teams, over the finances. That's my responsibility. Are y'all with me? So my question to you is who's responsible, who's responsible to do what within the church, right? So let's just take your house at the house. Whose responsibility is it to take the trash out? If you live by yourself, it's you, right? If you're married, it's always the other spouse. Doesn't matter if it's male or female, it's your spouse. And if you have kids, it's all the kids' responsibility to take the trash out because dad's no longer doing it. Why? Because I did it until you got here. As soon as you can carry that bag, it's your turn. Right? And if they're too small, they can drag it out. Just drag it out. Right? And mom's like, what are you doing? Come on, they can pull that. I used to pull it when I was a kid. Right? So who's responsible Who's responsible at your house to take out the trash? Who's responsible for the yard work? Who's responsible to make sure that the bills are paid? Who's resp- so whose responsibility are these things? Right? There are responsibility as ho- homeowners, renters, wherever we live, right? That's our responsibility. So my, re- my question for you is this. Who's responsible, who's responsible to clean the church? Whose responsibility is that? Whose responsibility is it to, to watch our kids and do children's ministry? Have children's ministry? Whose responsibility is it to give? Whose responsibility is it to serve, to grow? Right? Whose responsibility is is it to what the church looks like? What's it look like in the, in the building? What's it look like social media? What does it look like in, in, in public? What does it look like on video? What does it look like when, when you people pull up to the building? What, is it, what does it look like in our social, in our social in, in, in community, in our, in our social standing? Like what, is the, what does Riverside look like? Whose responsibility is that? Okay, that got... Man, you're picking on us, man. What you talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm, I'm asking these questions because when you look at the scripture, it's not the pastor's responsibility. It's not the pastor's responsibility. Thank you for that. I don't know who that was. It's not the pastor's responsibility. When you think about God, God's responsibility was to send Jesus, right, so that we can have salvation, right? Have righteousness through Christ. Are y'all following me? But it's not his responsibility to what that looks like and how that's done. What we look like as the church. He gives us a description. This is what this is what my church looks like, a bride, right? And he gives a whole list of things what a church looks like. But it's our responsibility to, to try to do what we can to meet those standards. So when you think about Riverside, I can give you a list of vision, mission, I can give you a why, I can give you everything, but what it looks like and how it's done is not. It's not me. It's us. Are you following me? It's what we, how, how we do that. So whose responsibility is it? So now you're like, man, you're asking me all these questions. It's too much for me to bear. It's okay. I got this. I got you. I'm going to help you. If you don't have the app, if you do not have the Riverside Waco app, do not have our church app, just pull your phone out anyway and act like you do. Okay? I'm not going to be mad at you, and then when you can download it, when you walk out of here or while, we're, while I'm talking. But if, if you have the app, so that means everybody pull your phone out so nobody knows that you don't have it, I want you, to go to your, I want you to go to the church app, and I want you to open the church app up. Now, what I'm going to share with you is something that, we've, that was asked of us last year. And I ask a lot of questions. I'm always asking questions. I always ask people this, and I ask people that, like, what about this, and what about that? So if you go to our app and you go to the home page, um, you'll see a button there. A tab, not a button. You'll see a tab, and it says Connect. And if you click the Connect tab, right below that, um, there's some buttons. And then there's a button that says Get Involved. If you click that Get Involved button, you'll see two things. One, it'll say where everyone can serve, right? And then there's another one, uh, Be a Part of a Team, I think is what it says. Now, here's the fun part. If you click the, if you click the, the, the button that says where everyone can serve, when you click that, It'll open up a page, 
And on that is a list of everything that you can get involved with at Riverside Community Church. Now, that list, this is the part that's going to make everybody go, what? That list has been there for over a year and a half. And the reason we put that list is because everybody's always, I see everybody. We have people that come to us from time to time and they say, what can I do? What do you need help with, Pastor? What, do you, what can you do? And so we, we, we and I say we, as a team, we, com- we literally came up with a list of things that we need people to do and opportunities for people to serve and get involved. The problem is, is that when they look at that list, they don't want to commit. So the question is not, what can I do? The question is, what will you do? What will you commit to? Well, I, I, everything on that list, I ain't committing to none of that. Thank you for that strong, resounding no. And I'm not even mad at you. Are you following me? But if you can, if you can commit to something small, then you'll have even greater things that you can be responsible for. Because I believe that on the inside of you are some things that God has and needs others to know about and to serve others so that you can be everything that God has for you. But you can't do that if you don't do anything. So there you go. It's real simple. That's how you, that's how you want to get connected. That's how you want to serve. That's what you want to do. So we have to decide something, right? We have to decide to do something and to be faithful with it as a church, right? Faith without works is dead. Think about what I just said. Faith without works is dead. Faithfulness is dishonest works. If you're not, if you don't have faith, the lack of faithfulness is dishonest works. Are you following me? So if you say, if you say that you have faith and you don't do anything, do you really have faith? Then if you say that you're going to do something, you're not faithful with it. Now you're being dishonest. Okay, that went over real well. So we have to decide to do something and be faithful with it because where we're going as a church, where you're going, where, where we are going as a church and where you're going in life, what's coming and where we're going and where you're going is going to require for you to do something and to be faithful with it. The future's coming. Here's the question. Are you going to respond to what's coming or are you going to charge after what's coming? And if you've been around here long enough with me, I'm not the guy that waits by, that sits by and waits for the calendar to turn. I'm the guy that's looking at the calendar and saying, this is where we're going to turn. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. Who can do this? And I'm, I'm very, very patient. I don't have a problem with crashes and burns, fatalities. I'm okay with that. We resurrect them, lay hands on them, get up, you'll be okay. All right? If you fail, just admit you fell. If you stop, if you need a break and stop, say you need a break and stop. That's what I love about our team, that they've learned to be able to say, look, I need a break. I'm okay. And there's no guilt. There's no shame. None of that. Like, it's good because nobody, nobody wants to go to the Olympics, right? And your la- and one of your teammates, you're running, you're running a, a relay, and one of your teammates just shows up, and they really don't want to run, and they're tired, right? We want them to be, we want them to be 100, right? And so that's what we want. We want our team to be 100 all the time. So if that means you need to take a break, you need to take a break. Sit out, sit out around. We're okay because when you come back, we know that you're going to be stronger, and that's okay. Good? So that's what I said a second ago. Don't do something just to get into heaven or make sure that you're saved. Do the things because you know that you are saved and you're going to heaven, or in our case, having a relationship with Jesus. Amen? Did y'all get something this morning? Are y'all good? Sweet. Who's closing? Marco's closing. All right. All right, all right. That was a great message. I hope y'all agree as well. And I hope y'all got received something from it as I did. And while he was back there talk while I was back there listening and he was talking about, you know, doing things half heartedly or disgruntled with the with the without the right heart because you just want to say yes. You, and because you didn't want to turn something down. And I was thinking about how, if, you, if anybody knows me, there was a time when I thought I wanted to go into the barbecue business and I wanted to do my own briskets and, and whatnot. And I had my logo done. I had my own Facebook page ready. I was gung-ho about it. And then after a while, I realized this is cooking was more of a hobby for me, something that I like to do whenever I felt like cooking for people I know. And it wasn't much of a, a business where I wanted to do this every day and and, and cook. 
Because, you know, cooking a brisket is real complicated. It's not like a one-hour cook. It's an all-day process. It's a 12-hour process um, to the point where I said, okay, I, I, I decided that it's just going to be a hobby. I'm not going to pursue it. I wasn't advertising no more. But people kept back, coming back like, hey, Margo, I, I, want, I want to buy some brisket for you. I'm like, nah, I kind of stopped that. I'm not, not that, you know, that's not what I do anymore. And they'll be like, come on, do it. Like, I'm sorry, I'm at the pass. Because, you know, it, it's it's a big commitment. Uh, so that's what I was thinking about. And then my sister was also telling me about, her, you know, she did this mural and how it became almost like a job. And, you know, and there, she was being rushed to uh, do it. So a lot of times not everything is supposed to be a business. Not everything. You can't commit to everything. You got to know how to say no, uh, or, you know, and pass. But with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and, and pray us out and dismiss us. Uh, thank you, Father, uh, for today's message, Father. Thank you for the wisdom, Father, and the teaching that we're learning, Father, so that we could be better humans, Father, better disciples, Father, uh, let, letting us know when it, we should decide if we want to do something or not, because we want to make sure when we do something, we do it with a great heart, with great intentions, Father, in your name. And then in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.